Archie, one of your most recent books is The Brilliant More Than a Game, and again, I've got that here with me today. It basically describes your own experiences of the Celtic Rangers rivalry from as far back as 1949, Sammy mm-hmm. Cox and mm-hmm. Charlie Tully, right Very through true. to the modern day. And it's the in-depth story of the Hamden riots, basically, of 1980. You know, that's told throughout the book. But there's also very significant events, you know, between the two clubs that are, are littered through it. And it's, it's a brilliant read. It's, it's really enjoyable. And it covers various things over the last, I don't know, 75 sure. years or so. Sure. Can you tell us about that as a, a project and how it all came to be? The book itself? Yeah. Well, um, the curious thing about the game, that particular game which sparked it off, was that I got more satisfaction out of describing the riot than I did about the game itself. I, know, I, I mean, that might sound a little bit indecent, but that was a fact of it because the game itself, um, although Celtic won that game, the game itself was pretty boring, actually, if you look back on it. So um, I thought that 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 is the pinnacle of all that we knew and lived with in the sectarian clashes that took place between the two clubs uh, over the years. And I felt somehow or other I had to expand on that. I had to talk about that game itself and what happened in the game, how it came about, um, the invasions and so on. And also referring back to the bits in history which suggested that, that that feeling of enmity that seems to be the undercurrent associated with the, the old firm. Was the the events of, of that day in 1980, you know, obviously this book was published, I think, in 2020, so, mm. you know, 40 years down the track, but did they remain, you know, clear just given the, the drama of the day? At that time. Oh, oh, absolutely. Absolutely they did. Um, as I said, the, the game itself was not notable and consequently I have vivid memories of, of what to do about uh, describing a riot. Uh, I mean, I ended up being quoted in the editorials in The, in the Scotsman, uh, which was a, a rather unique experience uh, for a commentator, you know, uh, which is usually in the sports pages. But I had to bring into mind to the people who were watching that, this is the culmination of years, century, decades of of collisions between these two clubs and of bigotry, sectarianism. One of your famous lines, and it's right here on the back cover of the book, is that this is like a scene from Apocalypse Now, you know, yeah. such was the, the drama. Sure. Yeah. On the on the playing surface. For anyone who wants to watch it, if you've not seen it, you can see footage of all of this, mm. including your own commentary, actually, on YouTube and, and various other places. Um, and like any event of this nature, shortly afterwards, the, the blame game starts. And there's various folks that have been blamed for the events of 10th of May 1980, from the police to Margaret Thatcher to Danny McGrain himself. But who do you think the, the blame mostly lies with? Uh, I think with us with everybody, with society, for accepting for so long institutional bias and bigotry. I think it was all of us. We were all responsible. We all accepted it. We winked at it. We we tried to make it simply an amusing uh, subject, uh, and it didn't really matter in life. It did matter in life. And that was when it became uh, dramatically... Uh, exposed on our football field. And as I watched it, I looked down on that and I just, I was thinking to myself, this is this is what they've always wanted to do. This is something that they've, they've kept in abeyance and now the opportunity is there. I mean, um, it, just to give you an instance, I use in the book the little village that I'd talk in where the pub, the main pub on the main street, Catholics went in one door, Protestants went in the other door to show you the ludicrous situations that existed, even in small communities. We were tarnished by this. The whole of society was tarnished by this, which which is why I've written about politicians suddenly waking up and nil by mouth came into existence with Cara Henderson, uh, a lovely lady. Never met her, but I spoke to her over the phone from her, her home, I think it was in Switzerland at, at the time. And uh, that's what I mean. 
it was universal acceptance of this feeling of hostility between two groups of people who thought their origins were superior to the other kind. Do you feel the events of 1980, as I say, 10th of May 1980, increased the the bitterness and, and division between the two clubs? It probably did, yes, because anybody, everybody had to look and see who, who who was to blame for this. And of course, there were different kinds of blames. I know a poor policeman was blamed for opening the doors and le- letting the people onto uh, the park. Uh, but we all know what happened in other places in England when the gates weren't opened and we had disasters uh, and so on. And um, the the, the police, uh, again, had they taken it really seriously? Um, I know that the police were angered by some of the comments I made uh, about lack of police. Where are the police? Sort of feeling about it. That has nothing to do with the the attitudes of both sides, but it has to do with the organisation and control of what was happening. And they were found wanting, clearly found wanting. And there's a few um, pieces of information that explain why there was less police in the day. I think uh, the costs for policing went up under Thatcher and it caused Hamden and others to start cutting their cloth accordingly. And there was far less in attendance on the day. But there's so many factors, as I say, whether it's the police... Margaret Thatcher, Danny McGrain, society sure, sure, as a whole. Sure. Lots at play there, Archie. As I say in the book, the, the 1980 riots is a theme that goes throughout the story from start to finish, but there's so many different stories interspersed. You know, interesting, as I say, you go back to 1949 where Sammy Cox and Charlie Tully nearly started a riot. Mm-hmm. Um, you witnessed some stuff on the streets of Glasgow around Shettleson at that time. Mm-hmm. And there's various stories beyond that. One is what I would describe as a, a, a farcical situation in 1987 when after a Celtic Rangers game at Ibrooks, you've got... Frank McAvenny, Terry Butcher, Chris Woods and Graham Robertson taken, sorry, Graham Roberts taken to court on a charge that read as follows. The charge against you is that on 17th of October within Ibrook Stadium, Edmonston Drive, Glasgow, while participating in a football match, you did conduct yourselves in a disorderly manner and commit a breach of the peace. Archie, was that whole thing every bit as ridiculous as it sounds? It does. It, it, it does because it wasn't getting to the root uh, of the problem. I mean, Rangers and and Celtic define what we know as as bigotry and knew it for years. And people realised they hated each other. And uh, as a result, we got eventually... I mean, that that, that is kind of legalese uh, apology, apologia, if you like, that seems to think that uh, footballers are like any other uh, criminals or miscreants in society. They're not. Rangers and Celtic players define a special hostility, which I'm not sure, I'm I'm maybe slightly out of touch now, I'm not sure if it still exists quite as much as it used to. And we'll revisit that question just towards the end, Archie. It's, it's a very valid point. Um, in terms of the the court case against the the four figures mentioned, you were actually called to be a, a potential witness and to yes. provide a character reference. Is, yes. is that correct? That's right, yes. Um, you know, it, it, it was very odd to, to, be, to be thinking of what do you say in these occasions? I mean, do I, do I uh, now go on waxing lyrical about the social dimension, the hatreds, uh, and so on. Because was there any possible way I was going to criticise these players? Where do you think my standing would be? And anybody would have looked at what I said and said, there you are, I told you about him. I told you about him. So that would have been very difficult. Yeah, but thankfully you weren't called. And I mean, the case itself, I think... The Roberts and Butcher eventually get convicted without yes, sounding too dramatic. Yeah, yeah. But I think there is definitely, and you've leaned on it in the book, leaned towards it, that the trials in 1987 came almost as a, a knock-on from the, the fear that was still lingering after the 1980 riots. And it just seemed like a, a crass overreaction at the time. I actually think, again, you can see the footage of the, the game on, on YouTube and the likes. 
there's nothing too over the top. There's a few skirmishes in the box and it's mm. it's nothing near as dramatic no. as it was made out to be. No. Um, another battle that you covered, but this one very much off the park as such, would be the one between Fergus McCann and David Murray, which played out across the, the 80s and, mm. and 90s at Celtic and Rangers. And two personalities with very different styles. What would your own experiences actually be of both of those men's men during those times? Well, Fer Fergus McCann <clears throat> was um, somebody I didn't get to know all that well. Um, it was coming at a, a period in my life when I wasn't doing as much work uh, up front for BBC Scotland. And uh, I have to say about uh, David Murray, uh, he, to, my, <laughs> to my mind he was a Tory and um, I always accept him accepted him as a Tory uh, who happened to be chairman or owner of Rangers uh, Football Club and I never took to him uh, for that reason uh, alone. Fergus McCann, of course, we heard about him coming across and I think it was with Hugh Keevans he was uh, excluded, as I understand from the, the stadium on one occasion and told not to come in for an interview or, or something like that because he didn't know terribly much about him. So I, I, I didn't really know all that much about Tiff, I guess. In terms of David Murray, he's a guy that you certainly will have got to know very well, as with most of the media set at that time. Um, within the book, you cover the episode in, in 2012, for, you know, and Rangers obviously eventually were liquidated as a result of, of actions before that time. And David Murray, post that event, claimed that he was quote-unquote duped by Craig White when he sold the club to him. What's your take on that? Was was Murray being disingenuous at best? Well, I remember that on that occasion particularly, um, I, I thought of the, the manager, the Dutch manager at that time. Dick Advocat. Dick Advocat, who spent money like uh, it was his own, you know, and heavily indebted Rangers. And Murray allowed them to do that. Um, so there was a discord there it was the Rangers' dis disadvantage. And of course, as you say, they, 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 they went into liquidation. Was he duped, quote unquote? Well, I don't think so. I don't really think so. I think he was a man. He was a successful man in many ways. And I, I would have thought he knew exactly what was going around, uh, along around him. Yeah, I would say so too. Um, Fergus, you, you mentioned that you didn't get to know him particularly well. But you, you do mention, and rightly, the fact that after winning the league with Wim Janssen in the 97-98 season, he's then booed on Flag Day the following season. So, you know, Celtic raised the flag on the opening day of the season, which I think now um, most fans who, who took part in the booing regret that and they feel they were maybe swayed by some media influence at the time. How do you think Fergus McCann should be remembered now, you know, history-wise in terms of Celtic? Well, as a su su successful man who came from an entirely different environment and uh, stood up to Rangers, stood up to Murray, uh, and in that sense he, he was a victor. Um, he was entirely different from the kind of person who came into football that we knew in the past. So the fact that he was different that way and also successful the booing, maybe you could tell me why they booed. I can't remember why they booed. I believe there was a narrative at the time that Fergus McCann was a baddie, to use that term. I think he was compared with Saddam Hussein at the time, amongst others. You know, there was some right. press coverage. Right. And I think, you know, we're in a different world now where social media and other things allow folks to, to carry their own messaging and, and get clear on what's what. I think less so at the time. I think maybe... Paper headlines of the day swayed certain elements of the fan base, and that's the yeah, sure. the story around that. Um, there's another saga, and it definitely is a saga that you cover within the book, and it concerns Mo Johnson. Um, you were there, I believe, at Ibrox in 1989 when he was unveiled as a Rangers player, mm -hmm. much to the shock of all those in attendance. Mm -hmm. Can you tell us about that time and, and how big an impact that had? Well, huge impact. I remember getting a phone call um, from uh, my son, uh, and he said to me, and I, I'm supposed to know everything, I was supposed to know everything that was going on in Scottish football. And he said, Dad, I've, I've heard a, a rumour that Mo Johnson has signed for Rangers. And I, I have to say, I said, no, no, no. 
that 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 is impossible. They wouldn't do that. Ten minutes later, I got a phone call from the BBC. He said, "We want you to go up to Ibrox. Something is happening there." And I thought, "My God, they actually have done it." So I went to Ibrox, and they had got a Rangers blazer from him, for him that was ten sizes too big, and the incredible situation was accentuated by him looking like a, a a comic figure with this huge blazer on it was it was too big for him and he just looked like a, a lost lamb that events had just swept uh, over him uh, like a you know a, a survivor in a storm as it were so it was it was really difficult to comprehend, and of course Sunus was just cool and calculated as he always was. It was obviously the first high profile signing of a Catholic by Rangers, given their their previous policy, which didn't allow for that. There was fans at the time, and I think you're not sure how genuine it was or not, but there's footage of people burning Rangers scarves and season tickets, and you know kicking off about. Why well, when I went, when I was going up to the stadium. They were shouting to me, Archie, can it be true? Archie, is it true? Can it be true? They didn't like it. Clearly, they, they didn't like it. Uh, and, of course, this is before I got into the stadium and I, 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 I couldn't answer them because I didn't know definitely uh, what had actually happened. Um, but, but, yes, it shows you how rigid their feelings were about the old system of bigotry it just reminds me of, there's a line that you do quote from David Murray about at one point he said they're trying to stop us from singing our songs you know how yeah, yeah. backward thinking he was at that time um, how negative an impact do you think Mo Johnson making that move had on the Celtic of, of the day Celtic obviously had a, a, a terrible time during the 90s you know on the pitch there was just very little success to speak of and do you think the, the Mo Johnson affair in 1989 played a big part in that Yes, I think it did. Uh, I, I, I mean, um, the the very fact that he scored a winning goal very near the end of a game. I remember coming out of the stadium, uh, walking past the Celtic end well after the game, and there were Celtic supporters standing there because the Rangers support go go the other way. That's when you you all got into the stadium and so on, um, and uh, they were depressed. They were deeply depressed, almost as if somebody really had let them down very badly. Disloyalty. You know, lo loyalty is very important, of course, in the old firm tradition on on both sides. And you couldn't quite comprehend. Well, we were finding it almost incomprehensible. So you can imagine what the Celtic support felt at that time. So it, it, was, it, it wasn't giving them an energising, enervating feeling about the club's future, no. And I think it also impacted the players. There's a quote in the book from Andy Walker, a guy who knew Mo Johnson very well, having played with him sure, prior sure. in Scotland camps, etc. And he says it took him about three days to get over Mo mm -hmm. Johnson scoring that winner. So it tells you the impact that it was having, you know, both with the players yeah, and the fans. Absolutely. And, and a lot of the range of support couldn't appreciate that. They couldn't appreciate that they, they had upstaged Celtic in the most dramatic way. And yet some of them didn't like it, mm. which gives you an idea of what that situation is. Yeah, and just to get back to that situation, then, you know, you've, you've touched on the question a wee bit earlier on there, but how do you feel the, the rivalry has changed across the decades? As I say, you know, as, as, a, as a young man, as a teenager, I think, you know, around about 49, you've, you've experienced some of the, the nonsense that goes with the fixture and then everything that's flowed since then and it's all covered in the book. How do you feel the, the rivalry has changed Across the years. Well, I think it's changed uh, be because uh, Rangers' old tradition is gone. It's gone. And they have to come to terms uh, with it. And what I think is happening is there is a kind of manufacturing of a dislike of the other side. You know, the to be part of the club is to actually hate the other side. That, that's that's part of your raison d'etre. You've got to hate the other side. 
So consequently, I still listen to people making poisonous statements. You know, I, I, I don't necessarily mean in the media, but just people in the street uh, and, and so on. So not just rivalry, but that enmity we saw in, in, in the 1980 final is still potentially there. Do you feel nowadays, Archie, in modern times, then it's maybe a bit more maybe tribalism or, or fitting in with a crowd as opposed to maybe deeply held religious beliefs? Yes, I think you've, I think you've got it like that. Hist history hasn't changed the tribalism, but it's changed the meaning of the tribalism. It's, it's a different kind of attitude they have. Hate Celtic, hate Rangers, um, want to do them down and so on. It's, it's not because of some abstruse feeling of religion and crucifixes and so on. It's simply about they're different from us. They are not one of us. I've read various commentators and, and journalists who have said they feel the the hatred, to use the word, is as bad now as ever. But I wonder, I've got my own thoughts on that because we're now in a, a time uh, in life where social media is, is prevalent and these messages are, are all around you. All around us, yes. And they're what fill those spaces. You know, yep. back in the day, there was no such thing. Mm -hmm. You would have the, the chat down the pub with, you know, friends and sure. at the games and that kind of thing. Sure. But now it's it's round the clock and maybe that's what makes it feel like it's it's worse than ever. But but I don't know. I, I don't really have well, the answer. Well, the, the answer is to, to, to your question is I, I simply don't know now. Uh, I certainly do know that Celtic and Rangers want to win things as witness the end of the season and how how bitter recrimination was still there in the outcomes of, of the end of the season. Uh, and I don't think that'll change. Should it change? That's a question I keep asking myself. Should it change? If it, if it remains within bounds of decency, if it remains, and we don't have a 1980 again, and yes, they hate each other, but... It's done in the sense of simply one club against another. Although I think I'm kidding myself on here because it is essentially historically different. Totally different from any other two clubs facing each other. And it's there because of history. It's still deep-rooted and will still remain as far as I can see. You first commented in that game, I believe, in 1963. Yeah. Do you think your own approach to it might be different where you're still commentating in the in the modern day? Uh, well, yes. Um, uh, I mean, I went into an old firm game uh, simply uh, trying to be as open-minded as I possibly could. Of course, there were people who listened to every word, not, not only every word, every syllable, every intonation, I was accused of saying woof. I never did say woof. I said oof or, or made sounds like that. And I didn't argue with people who, who turned it into woof. So in that sense, um, uh, it, it, it would be essentially different because the game itself has changed. I mean, I, I go back to the, the, the goalkeeper, the two full backs, the centre half, wing halves five forwards. I go back to these days where people just went out and played their own game. Now, of course, you've got uh, not, not only the systems that, that they're working now, you've got VAR as well. And I, I don't know how the various supporters view, Rangers or Celtic view VAR, uh, whatever, but to me it's killed the spontaneity of the game. No doubt, hundred percent. It's it's taking that edge away from from celebrating a goal. You, you don't know if it's a goal or not. Yeah, and that can't be a good thing. You know, in not terms of improving thing. the game, that can't be good. No. Um, just to touch back on something you did mention there, then. So, Archie, did you face accusations over the years of being sure. strongly for both sides? Were you sure. getting in the neck from both sets? Sure, sure. Of course I did. Uh, of course I did. I used not to go into pubs because I knew in a pub I would be confronted by somebody or other. So I did my job. By, by the way, as a drinker, don't worry about that. <laughs> you found a way. But I found a way um, of quietly getting on with it. So I didn't do that. And I tried to, to avoid trouble. It was, uh, I suppose, managers 
uh, I had the, the problems with, I had early problems with Jock. And then Jock's, uh, John Gregg banned me from talking to his players. Uh, I remember Rangers playing Aberdeen and uh, John was struggling as the Rangers manager. And Aberdeen scored two goals in, I think, the last 20 minutes of the game at Ibrooks. And I use the phrase, the supporters are voting with their feet because they were just streaming out the stadium. And he strongly objected uh, to that. Well, uh, any manager would, I suppose. So, um, yes, uh, I, I had it from, uh, from both sides. Uh, and in some ways enjoyed it. In some ways, I'm sure, but in other ways, did you find that difficult? Um, no, it, I, I actually didn't. Because I always retained the belief I gave something fairly and honestly. Um, but then people would say, ah, yeah, but you enjoyed that Rangers goal more than you did the Celtic goal. And you're up against that. What, what can you say? What can you do? Very little, very little. Um, as I say, the book takes things right up until modern times. As I say, it was published in 2020 and it includes... Two very significant events, obviously the, the collapse of the old Rangers in 2012, as well as the, the independence vote, which takes place in 2014. Do you think those kind of seismic events played a, a part in the, the ongoing tensions that we now see? How do you think they maybe changed things? Well, the, the, the independence um, vote, was uh, the, the, the referendum was, was interesting because I think, and you probably know better than me because you're with it, with clubs, I think there might have been a split in terms of the independence vote between Rangers and Celtic. I'm not sure about that. I think there might have been. Um, I, I was not a supporter of independence and made a speech during the referendum uh, making my views clear on that as a Labour man, always have been a Labour man, uh, and so on. But you're right in thinking identity, national identity, as we saw recently in the, the the Euros, where we had a marvellous support in a poor team, and more important was our national identity, and we showed our national identity well off the park, rather less on the park. So I think you're right in bringing that up. I think there might have been a difference in values between Rangers and Celtic in that respect. I think there very probably was, and we don't have the definitive stats on that, but that no. was certainly the feeling, the sentiment, the feeling at that yeah. time. And the the change in the landscape at Ibrox post-2012, you know, obviously Rangers come back as a new guys and mm. there's uh, a new club having to start from the bottom, work their way through. That in itself created a lot of tension between fans and essentially, or, or, or in ways, it poured fuel onto an already raging fire. Uh, yes, it did. Uh, Rangers survived, and uh, I suppose I don't know many people thought they would go out of existence altogether, and would have wanted them to to go out of existence altogether, because the Rangers Celtic, the the, the the Celtic Rangers fixture is one of the great footballing fixtures in the world, uh, despite the um, uh, uh, the other uh, aspects to it, and the other dimensions to it. Um, for days, you feel a, an old firm game coming on you. Um, and that is entirely different from any other fixture that I know of uh, in, in the world. And, and consequently, the fact that Rangers survived kept that going. Do you think we'll see a, a change for the better in the short, medium, long-term future of this fixture? Well, I think the fixture has been diminished by the fact, two facts. First of all, we have shown up the quality of our football in the recent Europe, which was well below par. We were out of our depth. That will reflect on our domestic league in this sense. Will people take seriously our domestic league? Because there is only one club that can win the league. And that is the club which is richer. And the club that's richer at the moment is Celtic. 
and they can buy whom they want, and it's all down to money. So there is an element there that is quite different from the old uh, old firm in the past, uh, and that's money. Uh, but who's going to take us all that seriously? I mean, a Celtic Rangers game, we think, is, as I've already pointed out, ex- extremely uh, involving of everybody. But what do the others think about it? What do the English think about it? Do we care about what the English think about it? I think we do. So we, we, we have to have Celtic Rangers actually doing well in Europe. They have to do not just something domestically, but do well in Europe to give to give our game some credence, and which has taken a very bad wallop during the Euros. Yeah, that has done, and I know you were on the, the radio just the other morning uh, talking about that. Um, the, do you know the, the unusual thing about the Celtic Rangers fixture is that it's absolutely the biggest fixture in Scottish football, always has been, and it's certainly our biggest marketing tool, you know, to use kind of business terminology on it. Yet Scottish football kind of shies away from it in terms of, you know, towards the end of the season, for example, the fixtures come out and they're always trying to make sure that that fixture isn't as crucial as it could be in terms of defining who wins the league, for example. Mm. They make it early kickoffs and, and all these <laughs> things. It, kind of to try and, and, and stop things happening like they did in 1980. Yeah. But yeah. then the, the, the other side of it is you've got a Scottish Cup final that took place this year at three o'clock on a Saturday afternoon where there was every possibility for all the bedlam that anyone wanted. So yeah. I just think we... You mentioned earlier on, Archie, society is, is perhaps to blame for what happened in, in 1980. Mm. And maybe society and the government's, you know, beyond that, have a responsibility in 2024 and beyond to look at just how best we address this fixture. I think it's one of the most exciting games and, you know, there's people I know who would be quite happy if Rangers no longer existed. For me, though, I think beating your biggest rivals is one of the best things in sport. Uh, Absolutely. At any level. I get back to that, the point I made. Uh, We'd miss it. Honestly, we we would miss it. Um, You know yourself... Two weeks before the fixture comes up, people are talking about it, thinking about it. I I can go anywhere in the UK, but particularly in Scotland, and people will say I'm a Celtic man, way up in Barora, or I'm a Rangers man in Anstruther, and that's it. They're identified right away. There's no other situation where you get that. Not just, we're not talking about parochial Glasgow, we're talking about the breadth of the nation where people are proud to identify themselves as either a Celtic or a Rangers man. And somehow, yeah, I suppose there are Rangers supporters of Celtic out of existence. Let's not kid ourselves. But um, anybody with any sense at all would have to say, look, this is a marvellous fixture that has to be retained. There was a suggestion in the aftermath of the 1980 Hamden riots that the game should be banned, cancelled. Yeah, and also that we should play it behind <clears throat> closed doors and just put it on telly uh, uh, and so on. We mustn't do that. That's defeat. That That, that is actually capitulation um, against what should be an ordinary format in life a fixture has to take place, even though it it, it engulfs people with emotion. Yeah, absolutely. I'll tell you, it's a brilliant book. It's one of the best Celtic books I've read in, in recent years, and I wish you every ongoing success with it. So that's More Than a Game by Archie McPherson. And as always, we'll link to the book in the show notes for this episode. Archie, final question for the day. We've covered so much, and I think we could go on for several more hours if time allowed. But what does life look like for you now? Obviously, you still pay a, a keen interest in, in Scottish football, but obviously you're not at the coal face of it. How are you enjoying retirement? Well, uh, I've got a book coming out in August, so <laughs> I, I don't think you can call it uh, retirement. I did it for the sake of the publisher. who has been very good to me. And he asked me, how would you like to write about uh, your 100 favourite goals? And I said, a commentator cannot use the word favourite. Impossible to use favourite. I'll use significant. So I've written him a book about these significant goals, including the first ever goal I saw at a football match. And that was at Hamden in 1946, 
when I saw Jimmy Delaney of Celtic taking a header from Willie Waddle of Rangers and ramming the ball into the back of the English net with two minutes to go. And that made me a football supporter to my dying days. That's almost 80 years ago, actually. 78 years ago. Yeah. Do you know the funny thing is about the book 100 Significant Goals or whatever the title ends up becoming? It's called It's a Goal. It's a Goal. You know that people of a Celtic and Rangers persuasion will be counting those 100 goals and if there's one more for either side, you'll be in trouble. I'm in trouble. <laughs> I can tell you right now that I'm in trouble. Yeah. When can we expect that book to come out, Archie? Is there a date for it just yet? It'll be out in, in, in August. Um and and it's not about spectacular spectacular goals. It's about significant goals. For example, I remember the first time I went to an old firm game, Parkhead, and the two players we were interested in, as boys who used to sit outside pubs, a Rangers pub or a Celtic pub, waiting on the results, and with Buddy, can you spare a dime? Look in our face. They would drop us a few pennies, depending on how Celtic or Rangers had done. And the two players were Charlie Tully and Wally Thornton. The two great heroes, if you like to put it that way. Yeah. And Charlie Tully had that marvellous game where he dominated Rangers. That's in the book. Do you know, it sounds like another good one to look forward to. I think you mentioned, Archie, that it's your 11th book, so... I foolishly mentioned retirement. It's, it's semi-retirement at best, but it sounds like you're still keeping active. To close things out, Archie, I want to read back a quote that, that you yourself said not too long ago. The great thing about loving football is that you cannot explain why you love it. It just happens. Chasing a ball around the park, wanting one team to win against another. I had no idea that football would create a channel for me through life. And Archie, that's exactly what's happened. And then some, I just want to thank you sincerely for sharing your stories today of a life in football. And it's been great to see you. Thank you very much indeed.